The Life Engine is an artificial life simulation that allows virtual organisms to spread, compete, and evolve right in your browser. I want to explore the core of this simulation, the sort of physical and biological laws in this virtual world that allow life to emerge. A cellular automaton is, in its most basic form, a grid of cells that can either be one or zero, colored or black, alive or dead. Every frame, each cell looks at its neighboring cells, its neighborhood, and decides what its new state should be by following a simple set of rules. Probably the most famous cellular automaton is Conway's Game of Life, which has the following rules. If a cell is dead and has exactly three neighbors, it comes alive. If a cell is alive and has two or three neighbors, it stays alive. Otherwise, it dies. These seemingly simple rules lead to some surprisingly complex behavior, and Conway's Game of Life is one of the classic examples of emergence from simplicity. Neural cellular automata, which I will call NCAs from here on out, were first introduced when researchers used them to grow images that can regenerate even after being partially destroyed. I strongly recommend you check out their work on this website, which is immensely impressive and obviously foundational for neural patterns. Neural Patterns, the website, gives you the ability to play around with the algorithm's parameters and strips it down quite a bit to its basic components. NCAs do a few things differently from classical cellular automata. For one, they are continuous, where rather than a cell state being either a binary 1 or 0, it can be a decimal value in between, like 0.5 or 0.2. This adds a lot of complexity and means that the update rule that defines a cell's behavior is more of a mathematical operation than a logical one. So why the neural part of the name? Well, the update rule is made up of two steps, first a convolution and then an activation. These are the core functions of what are called convolutional neural networks, which are tools in the field of deep learning. They're especially useful for image processing. They're very good at recognizing patterns between pixels and their local neighbors in a process that begins to look very similar to cellular automata. Each frame of an NCA is essentially generated by passing the previous frame through a neural network and letting it decide what the next state for every pixel should be. Hence, neural cellular automata. So the first step of the algorithm is the convolution. This is the local neighborhood part of the algorithm where each cell looks at its neighbors and determines its next state. The filter, this three by three grid of values seen here, is slid over each cell and each filter value is multiplied with the corresponding cell value in that local neighborhood. Then, all of these products are added together, resulting in the final convolved value for that cell, which in this case is 1, so the value actually didn't change. However, you have to remember that this cell is in the neighborhood of all of its neighboring cells, so it will affect their values as well. What will this look like if we apply this filter to every pixel on every frame? It sort of grows off to the right. This happens to be the pattern associated with this filter. The activation function is a mathematical function that's applied to each cell, where it is given the convolved value from the previous step, performs some logic, and returns what will ultimately be used as the pixel's value. In neural patterns, this logic is defined here, where you can write your own function in a language called GLSL, a shader language. This brings us to the worm simulation, which you can load up the same way. It has this funky activation function, which is essentially an inverted bell curve, or Gaussian. This is such a neat pattern to me. It's really organic looking, which is not what I was expecting to find. You may be asking, why does this filter and this activation produce this pattern? Well, to be frank, I have no idea. Neural networks typically have dozens of layers of convolutions with thousands and, in some cases, up to trillions of parameters. It really is unbelievable to me that a single convolution and a relatively simple activation function could produce such organic-looking complexity. I feel like I'm looking through a microscope into a strange computational microverse. So a brief recap of what the life engine is. Uh, it's made up of these square cells and organisms occupy these cells and they are made up of different colored cells. Different colored cells do different things for the organism. 
You can make your own organism in this little editor thing here. And you can also play around with the evolution controls to make different kinds of environments. A few months ago, there was an update that allowed you to save and load your own worlds and organisms. So I'll show you how to do that real quick. Here in world controls, you go to the save and load buttons down in the bottom right. Or in the editor, you can create your own organism. I'll just make something simple here with a mover and an eye. And you can press this save button down here and bingo. Dino DNA. you have the save file of the organism, which is effectively the DNA of the organism. And you can use this save file to load it back up, pressing this button down here. The world is a grid made up of square cells. Everything is made of cells. These are the sort of atoms of the world, the building blocks of the environment and its organisms. They can be different types, like food. Now, organisms are structures of cells. Here we have the default organism, which is three cells, three anatomy cells. Here are all of the anatomy cells laid out. These cells can only exist within an organism. They can only be part of an organism's structure. So let's walk through what each of these do. The most important is the orange mouth cell, which eats food in directly adjacent cells. So we can place food all around it, and on the next frame, it will eat the food directly adjacent to it. Every organism needs to eat as much food as it has cells in its body in order to reproduce, so every organism needs a mouth. The green producer cell generates food, creating it in adjacent cells. Every frame, it has a small random chance of producing one food cell in one adjacent cell until it eventually fills up, as you can see here. That random chance can be tuned in the Simulation Controls tab. The light blue mover cell allows the organism to move and rotate randomly. We'll get more into that in a bit, but all it needs is a single mover cell and it will bump around the environment. The red killer cell harms and potentially kills organisms when it touches them in directly adjacent cells. The purple armor cell defends against this simply by ignoring the effect of the red cell when it's touched. And finally, the eye cell, the light purple cell with a slit indicating the direction it's looking, up, down, left, or right. The eye allows the organism to see and alter its movement based on its perceptions. And so here we have the standard starting organism, made up of a mouth cell and two producer cells, which produce food that is immediately eaten by the mouth. Now that we understand its basic anatomy, let's walk through its life cycle. Once an organism is born, a timer begins counting down until its eventual death, when it is turned into food. The length of an organism's lifespan is calculated by multiplying the number of cells it has by the simulation control parameter called lifespan multiplier. In this case, it has three cells with a lifespan multiplier of 100, so it will live for 300 frames. Another way organisms can die is by being killed by other organisms. When touched by a killer cell, an organism will take one damage, and once it has taken as much damage as it has cells in its body, it will die. Again, this organism has three cells, and after taking three damage, it dies. This allows organisms to prey on each other by killing and eating them, including members of their own species and even their own children or parents. It also means that larger organisms are better defended since they can take more damage. Now, of course, the goal of an organism is to reproduce before it dies. So once an organism has eaten as much food as it has cells in its body, it will attempt to reproduce. The larger the organism, the more food it needs to reproduce. Offspring are formed by first cloning the current organism and then potentially mutating it. And by default, an organism selects a random direction and moves one cell per frame in that direction. After a certain number of frames, it will change directions and rotation. This number is called the move range, and it can mutate over time. If I add an eye to the organism and put some food right in front of it, uh, we can see that it moves right towards the food and eats it. And uh, we can see that there's some mutation happening there as well. Now, the way eyes work is that any organism can evolve eyes, but when an organism has both eyes and mover cells, it is given a brain. The eye looks forward and sees the first non-empty cell type within a certain range. The brain will then think about this and decide what to do. It can act by either moving away from the observed cell, moving towards it, or just ignoring it and continuing in whatever direction it wants. The brain maps all the different cell types to one of these three possible actions. So for instance, by default, the brain will move towards food and away from killer cells. 
These behaviors are also subject to mutation, and the organisms can learn better ways of navigating their environment. Do organisms have genes? Functionally, yes. Information is being copied and pasted from parent to offspring, information that defines the makeup and behavior of that organism. So, genes. It's not clear-cut genetic code like DNA or a string of ones and zeros. It's more of a mishmash of parameters and data structures that are less straightforward. But it doesn't really matter. Information, i.e. genes, are being passed to posterity, and they can mutate over time. Now, how does mutation work? Well, when born, offspring have a small chance to mutate their anatomies in three different ways. It can grow a new cell with a random type, it can change the type of an already existing cell, or it can lose a cell. Note that this can result in organisms with gaps and cells disconnected from the rest of its body. I consider this a feature, not a bug. Additionally, if an organism mutates, there is a 10% chance that mutation will also alter other miscellaneous traits. These traits include the movement range, brain decisions, and the probability of mutation itself, which I call the mutability. And it doesn't really take any more rules or systems or code to build in the evolution itself. Organisms that survive, eat food, and reproduce propagate throughout the environment. And those with more advantageous mutations, or genes, will propagate more. True natural selection. No need for a hard-coded fitness function that evaluates whether an organism should survive or not. Through trial and error, organisms will discover strategies to better propagate their genes, and others will have to adapt or die. This is my submission, the hunter, the classic invasive species. As you can see, it's spreading pretty quickly. And I'm also going to load up the small bush killer, which is another submission that's very similar to the hunter and does a very similar job. So I'm also adding that You can watch the two compete. And they both do a pretty good job of wiping out the current environment. All right, let's go ahead and add in the classic uh, purple flower, which should help stabilize this environment. Uh, so if we add that in, in a couple spots, we can see that it's starting to grow and survive. Uh, this was also my submission. But we can also add this new uh, Rosus finalis, the final rose, um, which is another organism that is sort of like the purple flower. It's just a producer with a bunch of red uh, killer cells on the corners, and it outcompetes everything. It's uh, an incredibly good organism at surviving. We can watch it uh, as it outcompetes the purple flower, it outcompetes the hunter, it uh, pushes everything out of the way. Uh, it is a very dominant species. But what we can do is we can uh, load up the quadratus anxious, anxious, the anxious square. Uh, this organism is kind of the perfect symbiotic organism with the uh, rose. It's just a square that runs away from everything except for food. Uh, and it has a bunch of eyes. And you can see it's just sort of jittering around, avoiding uh, running into the uh, final rose. Um, I really like this relationship. It looks kind of goofy, but it's super effective and it will basically dominate every ecosystem with at least the default uh, simulation controls. I like how they kind of bunch up on the edge there. What emerges is a diverse ecosystem of complex and interdependent life, ever competing, ever adapting, ever evolving, endless forms most beautiful.